From our State House studio in Montgomery, I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. It has been an action-packed day in the legislature as the House and Senate met for the 28th legislative day. That leaves two possible days left in this year's regular session. With Thursday being the 29th legislative day, lawmakers tell us the most likely scenario is coming back next Tuesday for the 30th and final day. The action started this morning on the steps of the State House, where a bipartisan group of legislative leaders held a news conference calling on the Senate to pass legislation eliminating income taxes on overtime wages. House Bill 217 is sponsored by House Democratic leader Anthony Daniels, but it enjoys broad support from Republicans. This is a simple proposal. This proposal rewards hard work. It gives individuals with that works overtime an opportunity to make more money without their actual employer having to actually do an increase in their wages. And so this makes sense for Alabamians, hardworking Alabamians across the state of Alabama. Uh, what it does is uh, the state of Alabama t uh, income tax rate is at 5%. And so when you're doing time and a half, 5% is a lot more stringent than 5% of your base pay. And so what we want to do is eliminate uh, that 5%, and so that 5% will go back to the actual worker. Uh, what that does is it increases productivity within the industry, whatever industry they're working in, uh, so that they can be at or ahead of uh, um, schedule from a uh, productivity standpoint. When uh, Leader Daniels brought this bill and asked me to co-sponsor it, I don't co-sponsor many bills, but this is one of them I felt strongly about because I know the people that works every day to earn a living for their family, it's a big deal for them. You know, if you look at the people that help us in our daily life, whether it's police officers or firefighters or, you know, the firefighters don't quit because the clock strikes four o'clock, it's time to go home. They quit when the job's done. It doesn't matter if you're a utility worker, if you're out there in a storm or a tornado or a hurricane, the worst weather God has to offer is when they're working. This would give them an opportunity to keep those wages in their pocket. Later in the Senate Finance and Taxation Committee, the overtime tax cut bill came up for debate. Committee Chairman Arthur Orr amended the bill to exempt only the first $2,000 of a week's worth of overtime pay from state taxes. Orr says the bill is an excellent concept and he could see it becoming a permanent part of state's tax code, but he said the state needs to take it slow. What I've passed around members is a cap that I'd like to propose for the, this bill is sunsetted after three years, so the, the cap is a $2,000 cap, which the fiscal note on that is a little over $21 million. The bill as is is around $45 million. The add back for the money spent per the fiscal note that I recall to the state, the state component, was about a million five, million seven that would come back and then you got the local taxes that would come back as well. So uh, I'd like to uh, propose the amendment uh, for a cap during the dependency and uh, as I think I told the Senate sponsor a little while ago, uh, I would see this bill probably coming back uh, and um, being something much more permanent and the cap either going away or being raised at that time. But I want to move slowly. As you all know, we've made a lot of decisions when it comes to tax cuts and tax credits. Um, again, good policy. Glad to move it along and uh, slow as she goes. But that's just the, the chair's uh, recommendation. I'm against this cap, Mr. Mr. Chairman, because I think this really kind of guts the idea of where we are. And because of Sunset, I just think that we ought to give this bill an opportunity to, to gather the data that's on it. You know, because when I look around and I saw us do a AAA bill that had not even met the $30 million cap, but we even raised that cap up to $60 million, not knowing what we were. This is going to directly help families, help rural communities, help uh, people all over the state that does uh, extra work that are working. We're already looking for a workforce. We'll slack on people. We need people to stay in and do the work that need to be done. I think this is something excellent to give them that opportunity to grow, to help grow families. Uh, this helped more than anything I've seen around this table and what we've been giving any tax uh, credits for. That bill now goes to the full Senate. The same committee took up the grocery sales tax cut proposal. House Bill 479 from State Representative Danny Garrett was handled in the Senate by its original sponsor, State Senator Andrew Jones. 
The bill passed committee as written, but Jones said changes would be coming on the Senate floor. He said the essence of the bill will remain the same, incrementally cutting the state sales tax on food from 4% to 2%. But the new version will address concerns raised by cities and counties. The County Commission Association has brought us an amendment which would basically say that uh, there are some safeguards in place for how fast they can lower a local rate if they wanted to do that. So that's in there. We're working also uh, to kind of shore up some provisions, make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So I really think you're going to see largely the same outcome for the voters. It's just a question of how we get there, making sure we have everything in place for a smooth process. Also advanced by the committee was House, House Bill 429 from State Representative Jamie Keel, which is aimed at recruiting more from the entertainment industry to Alabama. Specifically, the bill adds the music industry to existing law used to recruit film and television projects. Senator Orr amended the bill to reduce the incentives cap from $50 million back to the original $20 million. Orr says to expect more changes when the bill reaches the floor as soon as tomorrow. Speaking of the Senate floor, Here's a look at what passed there today and is headed to the governor's desk. House Bill 363 from State Representative Terry Collins would update the state's charter school law to improve governance and make clear that state dollars follow the student to charter schools, including conversion charter schools. House Bill 229 from State Representative Chris England would allow nonviolent inmates who were convicted under the Habitual Felony Offender Act to be eligible for a resentencing hearing. House Bill 6 from State Representative Kenneth Pascal codifies into state law that parental rights are fundamental rights and cannot be taken away except for compelling reasons. And House Bill 37 from State Representative Jim Hill provides that making a terrorist threat would be a state crime in Alabama. Each of those bills, again, go to the governor. Down in the House, lawmakers took up a number of high-profile bills. The first was one aimed at cracking down on retail theft. Senate Bill 206 from State Senator Clyde Chambliss would make a new specific crime of shoplifting and give prosecutors tools to fight organized retail theft. Retail establishments across this country are shutting down. Yes. A lot of them are shutting down in inner cities. Yes. It's because of the theft Mainly the organized, what we're seeing in, in, in the latter years is the, uh, the organized crime. It's, it's infiltrated this type of, uh, of, of theft. And uh, the organized theft rings that are stealing upwards of $100 billion worth of merchandise a year, reselling it on a different networks, whether it be eBay or uh, fencing it in the neighborhoods. And it's, it's gotten to a, a, a problem now that where they're pulling out of these communities. They're not able to stay in business. They're not profitable. That bill passed and now goes to the governor. Also considered was Senate Bill 261 from State Senator Dan Roberts, known as the ESG bill. It would prohibit state or local governments from contracting with companies who boycott other companies based on environmental social government scores. This bill requires companies that contract with the state to certify that they don't boycott other companies based on any purpose other than ordinary businesses' purposes. It also prohibits any business entity in Alabama from engaging in boycotts and divestment strategies. It's anti-diversity because we're talking about punishing companies um, for having diversity, equity, inclusion uh, departments, and we know that that is a good business best practice um, to have multiple points of view at the table so that you can provide comprehensive HR and support and also um, be able to tap into to new and untouched markets before. It's an essential part of business development and here we are, we're going to limit that by putting, by putting politics into the middle of, of business decisions. Um, ultimately this is uh, anti-free market, this is anti-economic free speech. That bill passed and goes to the governor. The House also passed Senate Bill 363 from State Senator Donnie Chastine, which makes updates to the Alabama Accountability Act. That's the state law allowing students in struggling districts to receive state subsidized scholarships for better performing schools. 
The bill increases the universe of students and districts eligible for those scholarships to escape struggling schools. It also increases the amounts for scholarships for elementary and middle school students up to $10,000. That bill now goes to the governor. Let's look at other notable bills that passed the House today and that are headed to the governor's desk. Senate Bill 99 from State Senator Sam Gavan allows those who serve on a jury to receive better compensation for mileage. That would be handled by the Alabama Supreme Court. Senate Bill 56 from State Senator Arthur Orr would provide for the use of cameras in special education classrooms in certain circumstances. Senate Bill 223 from State Senator Vivian Figures would update the Child Physical and Sexual Abuse Victim Protection Act to allow for child witnesses. Senate Bill 176, the Students' Right to Know Act, allows students to access information and data from schools in order to help prepare them for a career path. And Senate Bill 103 would require the Ethics Commission to provide any exculpatory evidence to those accused of violations. Speaking of the governor, she made another notable bill law today. House Bill 379 from State Re Representative Scott Stadhagen restricts foreign entities from countries of concern, including China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, from purchasing land in Alabama. Governor Kay Ivey said the legislation was important to protect military assets and natural resources, and that foreign governments have no business owning land in Alabama. With just two days left, plenty of lawmakers and advocates are making one last push to try to get their bills across the finish line. One such bill is House Bill 298 from State Representative Chris Sells. It would require cell phone manufacturers to activate already existing filters that keep children from accessing pornography. A group of conservative and pro-family organizations gathered for a news conference to urge the Senate to pass the bill before time runs out. I've seen how it can set them on a trajectory of harm and create rates of child-on-child uh, -child harmful sexual behavior. Today's mainstream pornography is very violent, degrading, racist, rape-themed, child-themed, incest-themed material. And what most people don't understand is that it is technically illegal. It is not protected free speech, but because our Department of Justice is not enforcing existing federal obscenity laws, we have to go these different routes to protect children from this predatory industry. In 2020, Alabama became the 16th state to pass a resolution to declare pornography a public health crisis. As a state, we've acknowledged the devastating harms to the brain, relationships, and society um, through this early exposure to this material. So HB 298 is a very practical next step that our state can take to protect children from this illegal content. It's simply asking manufacturers to activate, to enable existing filters that are already on smartphones and tablets. So it's just a software update. It's not a hardware change. It's not a manufacturing change. It's a very simple act for the manufacturers. And that's what happened in the State House today. Coming up next, I'll sit down with State Senator Dan Roberts to talk about that ESG bill. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Senator Dan Roberts from Birmingham. Senator, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure to be back with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Congratulations are in order. Your bill dealing with ESG um, has passed the legislature. This is final passage uh, went through the House today. So it is headed to the governor's desk. This was a kind of a big, high-profile bill this session. Lots of attention on it from kind of the corporate world, but it's, this is a national issue. Just first walk me through what ESG stands for and what this bill sought to do. 
ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance, and it is uh, has several tenets. One is very much related to climate. One is very much related to social, and then the governance thereof of the two things there. It is largely <coughs> large groups that have come together and are seeking to, in one way on the environmental, is lower the world temperature two degrees Celsius, and then bring us into full compliance with the Paris Climate Accord. So that's sort of the genesis of what ESG is and then affecting that through the use of money and power, board seats, and who they will and who they want to do business with, which really led us to their focus of this bill was dealing with the corporate boycott of Alabama companies. Mm -hmm. We felt like it was imperative that how Alabama invests their money, spends their money, not be used to then negatively impact our businesses here in Alabama. If you think back to last year, Young Boozer signed on with a West Virginia letter where state treasurers, I believe there were 27, 28 state treasurers signed on because West Virginia, as we all know, is a major coal producer, as is Alabama. But the result of that was to be a part of not causing negative impacts on businesses doing business in their states by how they invested, to whom they let contracts to, and how the state chose to invest their money. Mm -hmm. So if I have a mutual fund or you know a big conglomerate or something, and I want to push a progressive agenda, let's just use your example about climate change, then I'm only going to allow or people in that fund or, or whatever, do business with companies, who also have their own climate change policies, that kind of thing. And so the point is, I've heard the point be made that, well, that may not be the best investment. And that's what the Attorney General was arguing. Is that kind of what, what you're getting at as well? Well, that is certainly an area to look at, and we did not get very much into that aspect of it. Okay. But that is simply where you take some of the largest fund managers in the world who are then buying percentages of shares of larger corporations and smaller corporations to then impact board members who then are elected to serve on boards who then affect policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably the most famous is one large group played a major role in getting three new board seats, I believe it was on the Exxon Mobil board, and as a result of that, there was a large divestiture of strategic oil land that they had to another country who actually bought that and I believe the land was sold for a loss but they were forced to divest themselves mm -hmm. of that so that's a way that the governance can take place and we just want to be careful with our Alabama companies and how we can do yeah. we can't do anything about what's going on federally except encouraging our our federal delegation to take action and they are I'm very proud of the way the majority of our federal delegates are represent us in Washington. Almost sounds like trying to achieve through financial means and like you said social governance what what cannot be achieved so far in, in, in political governments. But but on your bill, so am I correct that it would prohibit state or local governments from um, contracting with companies that boycott other companies over these political that was our goal okay. yes that we it, we had to take some amendments on that took out some of the strength that we originally had in there but I still believe we wound up with a good piece of legislation mm -hmm. that we can work with and look I wouldn't be surprised if you see us visiting this topic as I think you and I discussed a minute ago this there seems to be a morphine going on with this whole concept of ESG so I think we will be looking at this for the next decade or more as the impact yeah. it's having on our state I do hear from critics of this bill and just this issue in general saying yeah yeah you, you have a point on the whole political you know political money situation but, but is it the role of government to step in and tell companies what they can and can't do, just from a kind of a conservative, laissez-faire um, perspective? How do you respond to those critics? Yeah, I'm a big believer in laissez-faire. We want the companies to be successful. Everything I've done since being elected has been about making Alabama business competitive so that we can compete much like we take great pride in our football programs in the state 
so too in our businesses. So the Alabama business competitive tax that you and I talked about in 2021 passed, and that was a big benefit for Alabamians companies and then for other businesses to come here and operate. I bet you'll see a lot of the ancillary businesses that will be associated with Mazda Toyota choosing now to locate in Alabama versus just across the state line and that's simply from the single sales factor aspect of what we got done. So we want our businesses to be able to compete and reflect Alabama values. So we're not telling them how they can do business. We're not trying to interfere on anyone's free speech rights or doing what they think is best. But if what they are doing is harming Alabama businesses and thus almost creating a boycott situation on certain industries, that's what we're trying to protect our Alabama owned businesses not being put in a boycott situation. I see. Switching gears, you also had this real estate bill uh, having to deal with large entities and, and big groups buying real estate. I'm probably getting some of that terminology wrong, yeah. but it was a, a highly watched bill, especially from the real estate industry. Walk me through what this does. It was. This was where we're impacting it's situations where you'll have larger head funds or large pools of money coming in, and they then will offer you a fee to then have a listing on your property for the next 40 years. They then record that listing agreement. You don't have to sell it right now, but any time in the future that that house sells over the next 40 years, they then are paid a real estate fee, whether you work with them, choose to work with them, but because it's a recorded instrument, they then are owed a fee every time that real estate changes hands. And you saw tremendous bipartisan support on this. You saw. Senator Roger Smitterman in particular stand up and say what you're doing is going to help my district tremendously. Think about it. Someone needs money. Someone comes off to them a thousand to three thousand dollars. Just give me a list and whenever you want to sell we'll get a commission. But that's for the next 40 years. So someone passes away then the heirs are stuck with dealing with that even if they want to list that property with someone else. And okay. as a real estate broker and masters in real estate, this seemed to go against what I would call true agency. So we passed that bill, which limits listing agreements to one year. I see. Almost sounds kind of scammy. You know, we had uh, the securities uh, director on here the other day talking about, and it's that's what it sounds like, knowing that they're going to win in the end, but maybe taking advantage of somebody who needs the money right now. Yes. Okay. That's why I think you had such broad bipartisan support. Interesting. Well, look, before I let you go, uh, I know you've got to get back upstairs to the Senate, but I wanted to talk to you about your pastor. This was um, actually during debate on, on your bill, yeah. and um, it, you found out that this tragedy had happened back up in Shelby County. Obviously, uh, we, we covered it here on the show. I know y'all were very close. I know it was a, a, a really heartfelt loss for you. Can you talk about that day sure. and what happened? Well, that morning, Dr. Harry Lloyd Reader III, who's the past senior pastor at Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama, spoke right across the street from us here at the RSA Tower, and he did a devotion on Hebrews 13:7. And he's a close friend. Uh, I'm an elder at Briarwood, and have had literally been beside him for the last 24 years since he came to Briarwood. After services, oftentimes I'm standing in the back with him just greeting people as they come and go and then serve with him very, very closely. We have a core group and we meet regularly. Matter of fact, every Sunday before the 1055 service, we would pray together. So he spoke, I walked him to his car. He did a great job, by the way, speaking. Uh, and then he drove me back to the State House. He was supposed to do the opening prayer at 9.30 a.m. But instead, we were delayed. We had a caucus meeting. We weren't going to go onto the floor till around 11 or 11.30 uh, last Thursday. It'll be two weeks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I said, go home. We will get you back earlier next session. He had an 11.30 appointment already in Birmingham. So we sat outside the State House for about 10 minutes and talked. Another Briarwood member walked by. We spoke to him. And then he said, I'll stay. You crack the whip, I'll make the trip, I'll stay. But I said, no go, we'll get you back next year. He left uh, just a little after 8, 8.15 maybe. And then at 10.01 a.m., when he was less than a mile and a half from his home, 
he tragically went over a little rise in the road and there was a dump truck parked waiting to turn left on a 55 mile an hour road, County Road 41 in Shelby County, and was instantly in the back of that truck and was killed immediately. So our community is hurting. I'm hurting losing a friend and a great brother and a phenomenal mentor and friend. But our whole community there, 4,100 members, I believe, is where we are now. So it is a, it's been a hard thing, but we know where he is, that absent from the body is present with the Lord, and he is home. It's a terrible tragedy. Uh, my heart, all of our hearts go out to you and the Briarwood family. Thank You've you. done through a lot so much, and um, I'm, I appreciate you telling the story. and. Um, in, in ways highlighting how important he was and, and, the, and the legacy he leaves behind. So I hope you'll pass along that to the Briarwood We community. will. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. And thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Bye. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page you can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at 1030 with more coverage of the Alabama Legislature right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.